Today, I present you with some of the spectacular alternate countries that you guys have sent me over the past few weeks. I hope you all will enjoy this kind of content, as I want to try to do more of these in the future, and give more of you the chance to submit your alternate countries. Obviously, I've been a bit inspired by Munsir Z to do this type of content, so the credits go to him for the idea. Our first submission is by Slaughter Republic, and it's called Knotsbull Russia. With a population of 170 million people, Knotsbull Russia controls an area spanning modern-day Russia, the Baltic states, Belarus, and the territories of Crimea, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and parts of eastern Ukraine. It has three puppet states, the Eastern Galician National Bolshevist Republic, the Ukrainian National Bolshevist Republic, and the Kartvelian National Bolshevist Republic. Its leader is Eduard Limanov. Some background for this country. After the Eastern Bloc collapsed and the Soviet Union collapsed, the new Russian Federation under Boris Yeltsin was an absolute dumpster fire. The Baltic states somehow have not been able to escape Russian influence and have been absorbed into the new country. Eduard Limanov, who founded the Knotsbull Party, promised to make a new Russia that is free and once again a world power. Limanov makes an army in St. Petersburg and calls it Novaya Bolshevitskaya Partia, or the New Bolshevist Party. Due to the Russian government already being weak and incapable, the Knotsbulls easily take control. Limanov establishes his new government after this. After Abkhazia and South Ossetia start rioting in Georgia, Knotsbull Russia starts an invasion in 2005 to liberate them. They continue to invade the rest of Georgia to assert that they can do anything without any consequences to the rest of the world. The peace treaty stated that Abkhazia and South Ossetia would be annexed into the Russian National Bolshevist Republic, while the rest of Georgia would become the Kartvelian National Bolshevist Republic. Lukashenko in Belarus gets assassinated by some Belarusians who hated his regime in 2009, and Belarus falls to anarchy for a couple months, until Knotsbull Russia invades it with the worry that they will join the EU. Belarus was then fully incorporated into Russia, with the Belarusian culture dying out as people became more and more Russian. After Crimea declared independence from Ukraine in 2014, they decided after a whole day that they would join Knotsbull Russia. Ukraine didn't like that, but they knew that if they did anything they would get invaded. Two days after Crimea joined Knotsville, Russia, they did invade Ukraine and absolutely destroyed the country. In just a couple of months, Ukraine surrendered and the peace treaty asserted that eastern Ukraine would join Knotsville, Russia, while eastern Galicia would split from Ukraine and both become puppets. Also, some of Odessa Oblast joins Romania. Knotsville, Russia in the modern day remains strong, with the eighth largest economy in the world. Political suppression occurs in the country with crackdowns and internet freedom and other forms of free speech. Successful policies promoting fertility have created a new, large generation of young Russians successfully driving the economy forwards, and with the Far East more populated, the threat of China's dominance there has been weakened tremendously, removing any need for the countries to be adversaries. Russia's sphere of influence includes Mongolia, most of Central Asia, the Caucasus, and more conservative Eastern European countries. Outside of their sphere of influence, Russia maintains alliances with China, North Korea, Iran, and India. This next one by Joshua B. is the Israeli Empire. Instead of occupying the Palestinian-given lands, Israel decides to buy previously promised land off Australia and Russia. Although Russia originally declined Israel's offer to buy Birobidjan, it was sold to Israel after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s. Nowadays, Birobidjan is as densely populated as the lands across the Chinese border due to high birth rates, and it acts as a buffer state. It has a strong economy that mainly consists of the tech industry, tourism, for Chinese people to experience Western culture, and exports to China. Birobidjan, being an economic powerhouse, has also made the Russian border region flourish. It has a population of about 6 million. The Kimberley region was promised by the Australian government to the Israelis because of this uninhabitable terrain. The Australian government viewed the land as a piece of crap that they don't need. Israeli settlers kicked out all the 3,000 natives, a move that is nowadays condemned, and built a port known as Port Einstein. The settlement is mainly used for maritime trade and has a population of 600,000. The rest of the territory is sparsely inhabited and only has a population of around 7,000. Kimberley is also used for the exploitation of natural resources. The Israeli Empire has better relations with the Arab countries, although relations are still uneasy. Apart from that, relations are mostly the same, but Israel has better relations with China and Australia. Also from Joshua B is the Anime Empire. Due to Russia's population decline crisis in 2023, Vladimir Putin came up with a genius idea. He teamed himself up with Studio Ghibli and other anime producers to create an autonomous region of Karafuto on Sakhalin Island for Japan freaks and anime fans. 
His plan is quite simple, turning the city of yuzhno sakhalinsk into a Disney-like anime theme park, where anime fans can live under the control of Studio Ghibli and other anime producers. It would be westernized enough, though, for the Americans who have never left their country. Work starts on revitalizing the rundown communist city of yuzhno sakhalinsk to Toyohara, and the idea of transformation of the island is made public in 2024. It doesn't disturb the locals because they love Japan and see it as a way of making their economy stronger. The first pioneers moved in around 2027. They are mostly people from Europe and the USA as well as Indians, who are dedicated enough to learn Russian. Putin put in this requirement so that the newcomers could integrate. Most of the Americans and Europeans moved there because they have an unhealthy obsession with Japan, whereas the rest moved there because of the anime studio business opportunities. Sakhalin Island officially gets renamed to Karafuto in 2031. The number of anime fans reaches 1 million in 2037, outnumbering the 500,000 locals. Karafuto tries to get annexed by Japan in 2045, but Japan does not let that happen because it would be an aggression against Russia. This leads to Russia trying to get rid of the autonomy and deport the non-Russians to Siberia, which causes the Karafuto War. At this point, the non-Russians number 2 million because the place is more established. The Japanese also find Karafuto a joke with their Japanese-inspired stuff. Instead, China tries to annex the island, which prompts the West and especially South Korea and Taiwan, as well as the rest of the West, to intervene. At the end, Karafuto becomes a de facto state, not recognized by Russia, China, and their allies. Here's one from one of my closest YouTube partners, Zerexian Mapper. It's called the Federal Republic of Intermarium. After six years of total destruction, the Second World War is finally over. After the Warsaw Uprising, the city didn't exist anymore. The people across Europe are now hoping to rebuild everything as soon as possible. Unfortunately, that will not happen in this timeline, as tensions between the Allies and Soviets escalates and World War III breaks out. In the following three years, the Soviets occupy most of Europe until they run out of manpower, and they are also tired of the war which allows the Allies to land in Europe again and defeat the Soviets. In 1948, the Soviet Union ceases to exist, and communism is defeated. Now the Allies have to establish not just a new order for Western Europe, but for Europe in its entirety. The Polish, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Lithuanians have suffered under multiple occupations at this point, and two ethnic cleansings. One out of three people have died in the war, and now they want to prevent to fall under any occupying force ever, but how? None of these nations have the power to challenge the Germans or the Russians, but together, together they could be the new powerhouse of Europe. The Allies also support the creation of the new Intermarian state because they saw the weak buffer states between Germany and the Soviet Union as a mistake of the Treaty of Versailles that shouldn't be repeated. The government functions as a federal parliamentary republic with a developed economy, since Intermarium was part of the Marshall Plan and didn't suffer under communism. The nation is dominated by the Poles and Ukrainians. After the war, the Intermarium reached out to France. Britain, and the United States because they feared that a strong Germany and Russia would try to split Eastern Europe once again, but just like in our own timeline, the German Reich was demilitarized, same with the Russian Republic. A few decades later, relations with Germany and Russia were normalized, and a union was formed in Europe that would soon connect the entire continent. The European Union Intermarium has close ties to all European nations, except Turkey because they had an Intermarium are rivals. In this EU, Germany, and Intermarium dominate the Union, and nations like France, who Intermarium once saw as their ally, now prefer Germany as a leader instead of Intermarium. Russia, on the other hand, once also wanted to dominate the EU, but they lost in the economic and geopolitical chess game to Intermarium, so they decided to join on the Intermarium side because they preferred Intermarium-led EU to a German-led EU. This creates a power struggle between the two sides of the EU that exists up to the present. From another close partner on YouTube, the Swedish historian, we have a united Yugoslavia in the present day. Seeing the turmoil and committed to stopping the violence of Yugoslavia, the EU decided to reach out a hand and save Yugoslavia. The country would be allowed to join the EU and receive massive support and investment, but would be forced to do massive reforms, liberalize and integrate itself to the capitalist world of Europe. Yugoslavia, unlike in our world, accepts this offer and the world would be forever changed. With nearly 24 million inhabitants, Yugoslavia became the EU's fifth largest member state, dropping to sixth only when Poland joined. The country is sometimes described as a big Belgium, organized in a highly federal, dysfunctional way. Nevertheless, the country has seen decent growth within its borders. It is highly decentralized, and the position of power rotates among the federal councillors on a biannual basis, similar to Switzerland. That said, the Balkans is no longer the soft underbelly of Europe, and a playground for Russian, NATO, or Chinese influence, but rather a well-integrated part of Europe. The Balkan region would be more sane, prosperous, and populated than today. 
Millions of people would stay in their homes undisturbed and no refugees would flee. Yugoslavia would keep growing economically and liberalize its politics, not only its economy. The nationalistic tensions in the Balkans would be much lower, the collective sanity much higher, and conditions of life better for everybody. Hungary, Romania, Albania, and Bulgaria might have a 50 to 100% higher GDP than today due to the sanity of the region, and Greece might benefit from this also. All the Balkan countries might be more populated today due to the relatively higher prosperity in the region. That's all the submissions that we have for today. If I forgot to post yours, please let me know in the comments and I will put it in my next fan-made alternate countries video. I hope you guys enjoyed this one and I'll see you all next time.